Please be seated if you wouldn't mind. I'm thrilled that you guys are here this morning. I believe that God has a very specific message for each of you here today. And I think this is across the board applicable for each person here. Uh, no matter how long you've been walking with Jesus or whether you're not even a follower of Jesus. Because we all have things in our lives that we've got to cut out and need to replace with better things. And today we're going to look at what Jesus has to say about that in Mark chapter 9. If you've been tracking with us. Us. The context of what's going on here is Jesus has come, he's transfigured, he revealed himself in a special glory to three special disciples, and immediately those disciples begin to argue and complain about who is the greatest, right? And so he says, if you want to be great, you've got to become a servant. You want to be first, you've got to be last. And now they, there's a transition here, and he's teaching the disciples and others about how to be a person who stands for the truth and lives a life that rejects the temptations of this world and encourages others to follow in that example instead of leading others down the road of temptation. I mean, we all have those friends in our lives that have tried to get us to do the things that we didn't want to do, right? To lead us into temptation. And if you're looking at me like, I don't have that friend. Well, guess what? You are that friend. Right? I was that friend. I was the guy. Yeah, let's jump off of the roof into the swimming pool. What could go wrong, right? I'm always enticing friends and others to do things that they were a little bit uncomfortable with. I got to see that play out this week at Balloons and Breakfast Burritos here at Dennis Chavez Elementary School when they cleared out the way, the path for the balloon to take flight. Hundreds of kids just racing, following the balloon. And Becca's little BFF here at school would continue to grab her and put her in the way of the balloon with her. And they would pull her and they would say, clear out the way. And they'd run and they'd get right back in front of that balloon as it's taking off. And we all have those people in our lives. And in Mark chapter 9, there's a, there's a very strong warning that Jesus gives for leading people away from God. I mean, there's YouTube channels dedicated towards keeping people from falling in love with Jesus, preventing them from it. That's their whole mission, their objective, trying to keep people from hearing about truth. And so in Mark chapter 9, Jesus says these words on page 845 in the Bibles that we pass out here. And it says in verse 42, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. I mean, it's a really interesting thought to think about leading someone into sin. Because we have three enemies in this world. We have the flesh, we have the world, and we have Satan and his forces. And it's always against us here. This is really dealing with the way of the world. Saying, follow this way that's against the way of God. And I'm very curious about gang culture. I've got a huge curiosity for it. I'm very intrigued by it. One of my best friends is a teenager grew up and he got into a gang at the age of 12 years old and so I tracked with him all the way into adult life and he's still in the gang today and, and so I've always been curious about it and Sadir Venkatesh was a sociologist and an economist and he, he works together with the author of the book Freakonomics and they give this story about how Sadir infiltrated an inner city gang in Chicago. He was a young sociology student who was doing his research. He went into the inner cities of Chicago, and he went with his clipboard and a series of questions uh, to only be rejected by a group of young gangbangers in a hallway of a staircase and sent him on his way frustrated. And he came back, though, and he realized having them fill out a survey is not going to get the information I need. So he spent every single day with this gang, and for years he gained their trust and developed an understanding of the gang and through that process he found out that the gang boss the big gang leader was a former graduate from college and had a business degree and so he kept track of everything he kept track of all of the crack dealers he kept kept track of the hours that they work and he kept track of the income that was received and the expense that was out of me ran it like a business he was a ceo of this gang and when Sadir took the information he received with an economist, they discovered that being a crack dealer is the scariest and most dangerous job in America. And you're thinking, wow, that's 
Uh, no real revelation there, Jared. They, they had to write a book and infiltrate a gang to find that out. But what's even more interesting is that the average payment for these crack dealers is $3 an hour. That's their wage. They make $3 an hour. Now, the Bureau of Labor says that a lumberjack is the scariest job, the most dangerous job, because one in 240 people die a year being a lumberjack, right? So you're looking like, wow, Jared, you kind of look like a lumberjack today. And if you wear flannel, but you're not a lumberjack, you might be a millennial, right? So <laughs> that's my uh, job today is to look young. Yeah, okay. And, and so lumberjacks, 240 people, one person's going to die. And so he discovers it's the most dangerous job, and they only make $3 an hour. And you wonder, why would anybody sign up for that? Who, who's going to sign up for that? Because you have a 25% chance in five years, they found out, that you're going to die. You're going to be murdered for being a crack dealer. That you're going to be beaten by the gang for punishment. You're going to have beatings from outside of the gang, turf wars. That you're going to go to jail on average of 2.4 times in five years, I believe. I mean, why would anyone sign up for it? And some of these guys in the deep inner city, you know, they, they look, okay, if I can't be a, a rap star or a movie star or a basketball player, that I see the gang boss. He makes all of the money. And so what does a gang offer that they're not giving? They offer acceptance, direction, purpose, meaning, togetherness, unity of sorts. They're offering something that they're missing in their life. They're missing stability and security and guidance and love and direction. And that's what we as believers need to do. We need to step in the gap of people's lives and show them and point them towards Jesus, that he is their heavenly father, he has a plan for them, and that they, despite their situation, that God cares about them. But instead, they've gotten caught up in this gang because others who are older have led them into this. Because if... We as Christians don't stand in the gap. Somebody else will. And those who have a, a vulnerability towards that kind of life are scooped up and they're influenced. And the scripture says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe me to sin, here's what it says. If you're going to do that, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he would be thrown into the sea. It would just be better for that to occur. Uh, that this is a strong warning here. You know, this the little ones. You can take it as children. You can also look at it as a young disciple, a young believer in Christ. I, I had a friend, when he being 21, uh, he was a follower of Jesus, but uh, he, he brought his friends with him, and they went out drinking, and they all got drunk, and they brought this young 18-year-old with them drinking. This 18-year-old was someone who went to church, but today has rejected God. You can imagine the impact that that one choice and moment that that friend of mine made on that person's life and direction. Like they're looking up to them. They're supposed to be older. They're supposed to be showing me the way to follow God. He's saying, hey, if you take these children and you lead them towards sin, if you take young believers and you lead them towards sin, this, this little ones, you know, we were first called Christians at Antioch. It was a pagan term to make fun of Christianity. He was calling them little Christ. You're just mimicking Jesus. You're these little Christians running around. You, you want to take people that have a chance to receive Christ and have faith in Jesus and follow God. And you want to distract them. You want to take them down a different road. You want to lead them away from God. You know what? It would be better for you to just have a millstone hung around your neck. You wonder, what's a, what's a millstone? Millstone here. In the original language, it's actually translated donkey stone. Donkey stone. Because a donkey would be attached to the mill, and it'd be a giant stone that would grind the corn, and the donkey would take its pace, and the strength of the donkey would push the stone. So it's this massive stone that would weigh you down and sink you to the bottom of a deep, dark, lonely place. Jesus issues a warning here, a command for us, really, that we should be people who love and invest in people's lives and not lead them down the path of sin. And so Jesus begins to deal with our own temptations as well. He understands that, hey, you know, this can happen. You can lead people astray, but you better be careful and watch out for yourself as well. Verse 43, it says, 
And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Is this better for you to enter life lame than with two feet and be thrown into hell? And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and to be thrown in hell, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. Now you're thinking, man, you know, this is a newer church. It's only been around almost four years, and I'm, I was kind of skeptical, but now I'm really skeptical of this church. Like, what's going on here? Is he really telling me to cut my hands and feet and eyes off and out? Right? No. That's not what the scripture is saying. It's not what I am saying here today. This is a statement about the ways in which I believe we sin. And it's a statement that is so strong, saying that if there is something that is leading you and causing you to sin, of your own flesh, that you need to cut it out. You need to avoid it. See, our feet, they walk us into areas where we sin. They lead us into sin. Our hands that were designed by God, that were meant to be useful and meant to bring uh, meaning to our lives, and they're supposed to be working for the honor and glory of God. Instead, our hands and our bodies, that they're not being used and utilized for the kingdom of God, that our eyes are seeing that which is evil and bringing into our mind and our hearts evil things. The Bible says that our eyes are the lamp of the body. So that which we walk in is sin. That which we do that is sinful. That which we see that is sinful. These are all kinds of temptations. And I think, what, what do you mean by walking? I mean, I, I have several pictures in my mind. Maybe you struggle with the provision of God in your life. You just do not trust God for the provision that he says he will provide for you. And so you want to try and get rich quick, and you're looking to cut any corner possible to make it happen. And so you don't trust God with provision, so you're going to take your salary, and you're going to say, I'm going to go try and double that at the casino. I mean, it's not entertainment. Like This is literally the way and the manner in which I'm going to try and pay my bills, and those feet lead you down the path to sin, to the casino. A place where you know you probably shouldn't be going in order to double your money to pay off your bills. Maybe you struggle, and that glass of wine every night turns into a bottle of wine, and you say, I don't want to drink a bottle of wine every single night. And so your feet that can lead you into the liquor department of the grocery store, you say, my feet will not go into that room any longer. The hands... And our hands are designed to be useful. Uh, we need to be teaching our young ladies and our young men that their bodies, their hands, that they're meant to be productive for the kingdom of God, useful. That their bodies serve a purpose to be useful for God, not dishonorable. It's in our hands. They're so caught up with whatever it is, trying to learn the new iOS update, right? Our hands that are just playing on the cell phone all day long, trying to figure it all out. Because Apple decided to change it all up on us once again. Our hands, that can be useful, but they are seriously struggling with only playing video games in our free time. Or we're not doing anything useful, we're just consumed by that struggle. Our hands that are be useful. We've got a little lawn envy in our neighborhood, and we see all of the neighbors that have perfectly manicured yards, and we drive up to our yard, and we look at our grass, and we go, oh. And so we set out, not to just be useful, to take good care of that which is God has given us, but we want to be just like the neighbor and even better. And so we're envious, and we put our hands to work, being distracted by things that can keep us from doing that which God longs for us to ultimately do. Our eyes that can see, that can bring temptation into our mind and our hearts. I've got a great friend several years ago, and he struggled with looking at pornography on the internet. And so he discovered that it was his cell phone that was the ultimate place of struggle. 
Right? We've gotten rid of the Zach Morris cell phones, like the construction satellite phones from Saved by the Dell, you know, and they've gotten bigger and bigger, and then they get smaller and smaller. And you guys remember the little flip phones, little micro phones? How cool is it to have the Star Tech back in the day, and, you know, a little flip phone? And now we've got smartphones where you can do everything you could possibly imagine on your cell phone. It's a little walking computer, portable with you everywhere you go. And so for him, the temptations were so strong to look at things that he shouldn't. That he said, I'm going to get rid of my smartphone and I'm going to get a dumb, dumb phone, right? I'm going to go from smartphone to a dumb phone. And he had one of those text phones, right? Little flip phones where you're texting and like you got to hit the button three times before you get to the letter C. You know, very inconvenient. Does this even text? What is texting? I don't know. I have a dumb phone. He's walking around with a dumb phone. Because he ultimately knows that he cares more about his marriage and the, the treasures that he's storing up in heaven that he gets to lay before the feet of Christ that what he has in heaven, the pleasure and the desire and the longing is fulfilled there that he can sacrifice these momentary things that we hold on to so desperately. You might say, hey, that's my struggle too, but my phone... That's my life, that's my work, that's everything. I can't go to a dumb phone. Well, maybe you need to delete that app on there. Get rid of that subscription to HBO or cable. Get rid of Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime where you just get, get it off of your phone. Put it in a place in the living room where everybody can see, where your whole family knows what's going on. Protect yourself. Cut the things out that are keeping you down a consumption of continual sin. Maybe you got on that app, Pinterest, and for the sake of your spouse and all things good and holy, you just press the button on Pinterest and you hold it long enough where the X pops up and you just delete that bad boy because you're looking at your life through the lens of Pinterest and you've got some serious envy going on about everyone else around you. You're bringing all these thoughts of discontentment into your mind and in your heart and you're lashing out on your family because you don't have what everybody else has. You do this all favor by deleting Pinterest. I'm not advocating for a boycott of any kind of company or app. What I am telling you is that if your struggle matched maybe some of those descriptions, maybe you take the advice of Jesus and you cut it off and you pluck it out. Because here's what it says. It's better for you to do that than to be put in the place called hell, where the worms do not die and the fire is not quenched. The word hell is Gehenna here, and it's a word that's transliterated into an English word for us today, from the Hebrew to the Greek to English. And it's describing hell. And the Hebrew word here is the Valley of Hinnom. It's a literal region where they used to take children and sacrifice them to the god Molech, the false god Molech. There were child sacrifices taking place. Later on, Jerusalem, the Israelites would use it as a place to burn the refuse, that they would take their trash, that they would take their dung, that they would take that which they don't want anymore, and they would burn it and light it on fire, and it was perpetually burning. It was a city of smells and fire ongoing. If you've ever been to a third world country, you immediately land and you get out of the plane and you smell the aroma of trash burning. You say, what is that smell? It's the burning of trash. See, in America, like, we do it different. We bury our trash, right? Or we put it on a boat and leave it on an island, right? So when Jesus says these words about hell, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched, the Listeners had a very vivid picture and understanding of continual fire and the stench of that which is burning. God's saying, hey, to be separated from me, to choose to reject me, to walk in this sinful life and not receive my salvation and forgiveness, that this is the consequence. And it would be far better for you to get the, rid of the things in your life that are keeping you from me. What's being said here really parallels what Paul writes about in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, 
He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, this list of things, it's because of these things that the wrath of God is coming. We read about the wrath of God at the very beginning of service in Revelation chapter 15. We know and understand that the wrath of God was poured out on his son, Jesus, that Jesus took our place and our punishment for the sins that we have committed in the past, that we'll do today, and that we will do in the future. I'm so thankful for God's grace that his forgiveness and his salvation is available for all mankind without discriminating. It's free for everyone. And God's grace, it covers our sin. It removes the consequences. So those things that put Christ on the cross, Jesus is literally telling us in Mark chapter 9, cut those things out. Remove them. You, you, you might ask yourself, gosh, how do I do that? I'm going to show you here in a few verses. Verse 49 says, For everyone will be salted with fire. See, one of the ways in which God does things is he allows you to go through trials and tribulations, struggles and temptations, and that it's the refining fire of God. You know, the salt is always used to preserve and to bring taste and flavor. This illustration of salted with fire. God is literally, I believe, saying, because of verse 50 here, the context. I mean, there could be 15 other translations of this, but I believe that he is saying life can get difficult and hard. And there are obstacles and there are temptations, but God can use those to refine you. And it's a part of the sanctification process of living out the Christian life here on earth until you get to heaven. That you're still going to face struggles and temptations. And God can use that as refiner's fire to preserve and to bring flavor to your life, to heal and to bring refinement to your life. So one of the ways that you can do that is you can choose to accept your situation and see it as an opportunity for growth. That God's allowing it to occur in your life to refine you. Verse 50 says salt is good. But it is, if it has lost its saltiness, how will you be made salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. I believe that having salt within yourself comes from knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. The book of Titus is one of the pastoral letters. and I like what Paul writes in Titus. In Titus chapter 2, he, he gives these words here to uh, these young pastors here. He, he wants to remind them about what the grace of God is really all about for a person's life and what it means to be salted, right? And so in, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion." And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. I don't know if you see that the way I do, but I see that as beautiful. I see that as beautiful. It's the grace of God that teaches us how to live upright lives. The beauty of God's grace and the beauty of salvation is that we recognize what the gospel really is. That we are bad. We are evil at our core, and we are in need of good. We are in need of forgiveness, and that forgiveness and that goodness is found in Jesus, who is good, who is not bad, and anything that is good inside of us comes from God. Acknowledging your need for God, accepting the goodness and forgiveness of God, and living it out. We need to teach ourselves the gospel every single day. Day, the beauty of the gospel changes our character. The beauty of our the gospel teaches us how to live upright lives. Paul also writes in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, or chapter 3, verse 16, excuse me. It says, All scripture is breathed by God, and it's profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, 
equipped for every good work. Mark chapter 9, we're called to cut things out of our lives, but we're not called to just leave that vacant, that we're to replace it with the salt, the goodness of God, the beauty of salvation, and the power of his word. The beauty of salvation and the power of his word. We need to replace that in our lives. So I want you to picture on the stage, okay, this, this stage. Picture train tracks being laid. Okay, the Word of God, first off, says that it teaches us. It's profitable for teaching us. Teaching us the track and the way in which we should go. That's what the Word of God does. It points out the way that we should go and live our lives. It's there to reprove us. The Word of God reproves us when we get off track, when we derail. When we go to the things that our feet leads us to sin, when we do with our hands the things that are sinful, when we see with our eyes that which is sin sinful and evil, when we get off track, we get reproved by God's word. It says, you're off track. And a lot of us, we get mad at God and Christians and others around us, but that's actually God's work in your life to get you back on track. Right? So the teaching of God's word shows us the way. The reproof of God's word shows us that we're off track. The correcting of God's word brings us on track. You can choose to accept the correcting of God in your life or reject it. But if you reject it, you'll never get back on track. You accept God's correcting, and then you accept the training of his word. The training gets you back on the right way. So, you see the way to go. And if you're like me, you get off of the way to go. And you're reminded where to get back on keep on trucking. That's what the beauty of salvation and the power of God's word can do in your life. Now in Psalms chapter 1, David writes, and he says this, speaking of the way of the righteous versus the way of the wicked. And today we really have a choice. Do we get to walk in the beauty of salvation and the power of God's word or will we walk in the consequence of rebellion? It says in verse 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits at the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and out. Its leaves do not wither. In all he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like the chaff of the wind that drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You know, my plea and my desire for each of us here today is that we can allow the word of God to show us the right way to go. And if we've gotten off track, that's going to look different for each one of us here. And maybe you lined up with some of the examples that I laid out for you today. That's just God's way of showing that you're off track. Would you let him correct you and bring you on track again to send you on the right way? Maybe some of you are here this morning and you've never accepted God's forgiveness. You've never felt the power and the beauty of his grace. Could today be the day that you accept that loving, kind gift that God extends for all men and women to be saved, to avoid an eternity of separation from God? A place that's described as continual weeping and gnashing of teeth. A place of eternal torment and separation from all that is good. Today could be the day that you make up in your mind and in your heart to follow God and receive the gift of salvation. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord. And no one's perfect here. Each of us struggle. We all face temptations in many different ways, Lord, and many of us are here this morning and we want to know how to break free from the constant cycle of the consuming sins in our lives. Lord, would you show us where we're walking into temptation and where we're acting out sin with our hands and where we're allowing sin to be seen and enter into our minds and our hearts. God, would you show us that right now? God, we just confess that to you. And we're going to tell you that we're sorry, Lord, but there's things that we're going to do that you're going to tell us to do to help us 
find victory and freedom from that sin. And set us on that right path, Lord. Let us get into your word, to hear your words, to enjoy the beauty of salvation on a daily basis, to teach ourselves the gospel every single day. There's power in the name of Jesus. And we don't have to look like yesterday, that our tomorrow can be different because of you. God, for those that don't know you right now, that they heard clearly this morning that you extend a free gift, a gift of salvation, forgiveness, and freedom. God, may they say to you, yes, for the very first time this morning. May they say, I'm a sinner, and I need forgiveness, God. Would you please forgive me? I've been running from you for far too long. I've been rebelling against you for far too long, God. I want my life to have meaning and purpose that's beyond myself. I want to live for you. Would you forgive me and come and dwell and live inside of me and give me the power and the victory over my struggles and sin? In Jesus' name, amen.